The study of science fiction literature remains an intriguing and evolving part of literary criticism. Although its study is increasing in academia, particularly in the United States, it remains a reasonably marginalised area of literature for many academic institutions within the United Kingdom, with only a mere handful of courses offered as part of language and literature modules. While science fiction works appear in any number of literary courses, they are often placed inappropriately in a context outside that defined by the genre, and more often than not these works are labelled as something other than science fiction. Nevertheless, its study through the work of authors and critics in journals such as Foundation, the International Review of Science Fiction, Science Fiction Studies, the SFRA Review, and Extrapolation, continues to thrive, although it would be difficult to find these journals in most university libraries. The oldest existing organisation which promotes the study and research of science fiction literature, film and other media, is the Science Fiction Research Association, founded in 1970. The University of Kansas in the United States of America continues to be a leader in the study of science fiction, as does the University of Liverpool here in the United Kingdom, home to the Science Fiction Foundation collection in the special collections and archives housed in the Sydney Jones Library. In choosing a topic for my thesis, and deciding to pursue my interest in science fiction literature, after some research, I was mildly startled to discover little work had been undertaken on one of science fiction's most notable authors, namely Frank Herbert. Herbert would be considered as part of a group of authors known as the Big Four, together with Isaac Asimov, Robert A. Heinlein, and Sir Arthur C. Clarke. This association was not from any joint efforts, but rather from the fact that these four authors became household names, primarily with the sales of their books, as opposed to the previously traditional means in 20th century science fiction of pulp and magazine publications. Of this select group, it is fair to say that Herbert stands apart from the other three because of a small number of distinctions. Firstly, Asimov and Clark were renowned scientists, a professor of biochemistry and a physicist respectively while Heinlein worked as an aeronautical engineer during World War II. Herbert, who had many scientific interests, was a journalist who could be best described as an enthusiastic amateur when it came to any technical or scientific expertise. Secondly, and possibly more notably, Herbert is the least prolific of the four authors, which might seem strange as he was the only professional journalist. It is possibly for this reason that Herbert and his works remain relatively ignored by science fiction criticism, though this is also true of his fellow authors in the Big Four. Herbert is notable above the others for his identification with one particular novel, Dune, published in 1965, and the five novels that followed in the series. Dune is as big a science fiction novel as one can find, big in size, big in sales, big in popularity, big in intellect and big in fame. It is considered to be one of the greatest science fiction novels of all time, often marketed this way, and its regard was high from its initial publication and continues to be so in the present day. Dune made Frank Herbert's reputation equal to that of Asimov, Heinlein and Clark. Herbert's status as a great science fiction writer was really achieved through one work, while the others churned out novel after novel and wrote prolific numbers of short stories. The Dune series is a complicated and vast story of political intrigue, war, revenge, evolution, and most notably, ecology on a planetary scale. Within science fiction literature, there are few planets depicted in such a vivid and detailed manner as the world of Arrakis, also known as Dune. Dune's intellectual complexity and vast timescale are what most likely prevent this work of science fiction from coming under serious study. Yet it is Frank Herbert's intricacy as a writer, the varied and intertwined themes, Byzantine intrigues, and the detailed characterization that ultimately have drawn my attention to the Dune series as a focus of research. Dune is praised and criticised alike for its scope, but in terms of criticism, it receives remarkably little attention that covers the range of the entire series. One of the inherent problems with science fiction criticism is revealed when examining the scant attention that Dune receives, 
in that such undertakings often show a degree of bias within the field. The focus of such criticism is often to question Dune's validity as a work of science fiction. It is also frequently asked whether Dune falls within the soft or hard categories of the genre, and to question if it has diluted its content of traditional science fiction tropes by the inclusion of mysticism. Mysticism is portrayed as part of one of the dominant themes in Dune, namely humanity's messianic impulses. More specific criticism is levelled towards Herbert's accuracy in his portrayal of ecology as a science, and the various forms of evolution and genetic engineering that are fundamental to the universe he created. I will show that such criticism is often flawed and tainted with the bias of such critics who often seek to promote their own works through such detractions. My intention is to examine the Dune series as a collective, and ask why it remains such an important work in the science fiction catalogue, while at the same time questioning why it seems to stand alone within the genre. In doing so, I shall focus on the inherent themes and Herbert's deliberate intent in weaving them together to make a dense tapestry of a story that operates on so many levels. My intention is to question Dune's apparent isolation in science fiction and to make an argument for it being a novel that creates an important bridge between the traditional golden age of science fiction and the more radical new wave of the mid to late 1960s and 1970s. I intend to show that not only is Dune a Janus facing work, but also that through the presentation of its major themes, it is quietly subversive to not only the social and political attitudes of its time, but especially so towards science fiction as a genre. In that sense, albeit praised by authors and fans alike, there is something strange and esoteric about the Dune series, making it difficult to categorise and place within the canon of science fiction. Although there are a number of approaches to science fiction criticism, a historical and cultural perspective serves best here, in consideration of William Tuponce's already existing work on Dune from a linguistic point of view, where he examines it as a polyphonic novel. A beginning is the time for taking the most delicate care that the balances are correct. I will always remember the first science fiction book that I bought through a school sponsored book club. It was a collection of short stories by Arthur C. Clarke called Of Time and Stars, and it contained two of my all time favourite stories An Ape About the House and The Nine Billion Names of God. As I glanced through the Puffin Book Club catalogue, I circled an image of a novel's cover, deciding that it would be the one I would choose. The wonderful cover by Peter Jones immediately captured my imagination. A spaceman weeping in his suit at the destruction of some interstellar paradise. This was the first of many introductions to fantastical literature, which included works by H.G. Wells, Jules Verne and J.R.R. Tolkien. When I read of Time and Stars, I began with the foreword by J.B. Priestley, which was my introduction to science fiction as a genre. Here, Priestley talked about the kinds of science fiction he didn't like, namely those that created an effect, where there was nothing surprising in the futures they create, and others that merely mimicked the western novel. This was in essence why he endorsed Arthur C. Clarke's collection of short stories, for everything in this small tome not only surprised me, but made me believe that these strange new worlds of the future were possible. There seemed to be, in a sense, a truth that although wasn't real now, could become plausible in the near or distant future. Priestley puts this down to the two qualities that as he saw it, a successful science fiction writer needed to possess. While scientific and technological knowledge are important for a writer of science fiction, there is something he must have to be really worth reading that is far more important. He must have imagination, and this must not be confused with mere fanciful invention. Many years later my introduction to the works of Frank Herbert began by reading Dune when I was studying science fiction literature for a postgraduate degree at the University of Liverpool. At this time it was some 12 years after Frank Herbert's death following a short battle with pancreatic cancer. 
through discussions with both students and lecturers alike, I came to discover the high regard in which he was held as a science fiction writer, but in particular the high esteem in which his novel Dune was held. This unusual and complex novel was by a general consensus amongst the students, the pinnacle of science fiction, the standard that other sci-fi writers should aspire to. It was notable not just for being considered one of the finest examples of the genre, but was also seen as the best-selling science fiction novel of all time. Curiosity drew me in, and I had soon read all six books in the Dune series, mortified to find it unfinished before Frank Herbert's death. As a work of varied motifs and a particular intelligence behind it, I find myself learning many lessons from its pages, both about the world around me and about myself as well. With both critical acclaim and financial success, why then, I wondered, were we not studying Frank Herbert's Dune series? On reviewing Frank Herbert's entry in one of the earlier editions of the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction, I soon found that I was curiously enough not the only person to ask this question. Malcolm J. Edwards pointed out that his work has been subject to remarkably little critical analysis, while William Tuponce, in his linguistically focused study on Herbert's Dune series, is also surprised by the little attention paid to an author of his stature. Given the size of his readership, both within and without the academic community, and the fact of Herbert's enormous popularity, it is surprising to learn then he has received very little critical attention. When browsing through some back issues of Foundation, the International Review of Science Fiction, I decided to look back to the time of Frank Herbert's death, and backtrack through the journals to see exactly what had been written about his work. At a time when science fiction was losing a number of prominent writers, most notably Theodore Sturgeon, L. Ron Hubbard and Frank Herbert all within a short time of each other, I was curious to see what was being said of these writers, with death generally being a spur to see academic interest invested in an author's work. Edward James's editorial in Foundation, shortly after the time of Frank Herbert's death in 1986, describes Herbert together with L. Ron Hubbard as the two science fiction writers who have caught the public eye more than almost any others, the first with what I suppose the most successful science fiction novel of the last 20 years, and the second with the most successful science fiction religion. Edward James leaves the body of his editorial, paradoxically, to a brief discussion on L. Ron Hubbard. The reason for this being he firmly believed Foundation, in the light of the subject matter that the journal focused upon, would not be inclined to show too much future interest in L. Ron Hubbard. This was due to the bizarre religious direction that Hubbard's work had turned towards, namely Dianetics, and the subsequent arrival and development of the Church of Scientology. Frank Herbert's death would certainly provide an impetus to discussing his works and impact on the genre in future journals, and therefore James promptly ignores him in the assured belief of future commentary. It falls to an additional note by Ian Watson, the features editor of Foundation at the time, to note the lack of any critical overview of Frank Herbert's vision and the tendency to concentrate on other prominent or controversial writers. He ends his brief discussion with a hopeful and optimistic call to arms for future academics to give this notable writer some serious consideration for study. To those critics in universities seeking future topics, we urge a spirit of adventure. Let them launch their boats into the still largely uncharted water of Herbert's world, perhaps. Sadly, both Edward James's sense of the obvious and Ian Watson's desire for academics to set forth and enter these uncharted waters of Herbert's literary visions are mostly unfulfilled. With few academic analyses of Herbert's work, it is for this reason that I have decided to follow Mr. Watson's urgings and examine Herbert's most notable contribution to science fiction in an attempt to address this oversight. Frank Herbert's Dune series has received a limited amount of academic attention over the years. Some of these studies tend to examine Dune as a standalone work, and while others do offer a broader look at the Dune series, they can be limited in the attention that they focus on all six books. This is primarily due to the times when these academic studies took place, the publishing of the Dune series itself covering a period from 1963 until 1986. 
Ecology is easily the main focus of study for Frank Herbert's Dune series, and the one subject which tends to centre most on Dune at the exclusion of the other novels. The study of the series from a psychological and psychoanalytical approach is also popular. Other research includes examining the Dune series from historical, mythological, feminist, and technological viewpoints. Of the research undertaken into Frank Herbert's Dune series, there are perhaps two notable attempts to explore the set of books in their entirety. The first of these works is Donald E. Palumbo's Chaos Theory, Asimov's Foundations and Robots, and Herbert's Dune, which approaches the series as a work which pioneered chaos theory, especially in its handling of ecology and Joseph Campbell's ideas of the monomyth. Palumbo's ideas are fascinating, though perhaps a little contrived in respect towards his notions of chaos theory as opposed to systems. Those of us not familiar with a good understanding of systemic thinking and systems design in all its multifaceted forms might be easily persuaded that Frank Herbert did indeed anticipate chaos theory, as Adam Roberts seems to suggest, but ultimately this is not the case. Palumbo's work also has a comparative approach, looking at Herbert's Dune series alongside Isaac Asimov's Foundation series. The premise that Dune has been written as a response to the Foundation trilogy is a theory put forth by other writers, including the likes of C. N. Manlov and Timothy O'Reilly. The second notable complete study is Frank Herbert by William F. Tupons, which focuses on the entire Dune series and investigates the books as polyphonic novels. Both Palumbo and Tupons offer as limited but insightful views of the Dune series, but are nevertheless the only real attempts to look at Herbert's novels as a collective whole. Frank Herbert by Timothy O'Reilly is an excellent introduction to the author's overall work, but being published some five years before Herbert's death, is only able to examine the initial Dune trilogy as it was then conceived, and therefore cannot offer a complete insight into the overall series. More for the fan than to provide an in-depth study is the recently published compendium of papers exploring the science of Dune. This collection, rather than any in-depth analysis, seeks to ask if the science and technology behind Herbert's Duneverse as it is referred to, has any real merit. A wide number of articles about the Dune series seldom look at the story as a whole. Both Susan Stratton and C. N. Manlove provide ecological examinations of Dune via comparisons to other contemporary ecologically themed science fiction works. The Messiah and the Greens, The Shape of Environmental Action in Dune and Pacific Edge, by Susan Stratton, questions the ecologically differing approaches between Herbert's Dune and Kim Stanley Robinson's Pacific Edge, asking how these texts reflect the ecological knowledge of the writers and their times. In addition, Stratton also examines the way that writers are able to depict their interconnectivity of human culture and the environment. The basis for Stratton's analysis comes from Ursula K. Le Guin's Carrier Bag Theory of Fiction, published in Dancing at the Edge of the World, and Joseph Meeker's The Comic Mode from his work on the comedy of survival, Studies in Literary Ecology. Stratton here sees Dune as being very much a product of its times, reflecting the demands of publishers and readers alike. In essence, she suggests that Herbert's Dune is heroic in Le Guin's terms and tragic from Meeker's, reflecting the desires of Golden Age science fiction readership and editors. Conversely, Pacific Edge is realistic from Le Guin's viewpoint and comic in Meeker's. Stratton sees Dune as being primarily a story about death, with Robinson's tale reflecting the opposite and focusing on life. Pacific Edge however is viewed as an inheritor of the growing awareness of ecological issues, and works that have pursued this interest in opposition to hegemonic dominance. Stratton therefore examines the relationship between the two novels, viewing Pacific Edge as an anti-Dune novel, and that Dune itself portrays a simplified ecology which is compromised by the heroic focus of the narrative. Stratton concludes that Dune was an important first step for a generation of science fiction readers who needed to learn the fundamentals of ecology, whereas Robinson's Pacific Edge is better suited to a more ecologically aware modern readership who seek answers to the environmental problems that have befallen humanity in recent times. The study of Dune in Science Fiction 10 Explorations by C. N. Manlove also forms a comparative approach 
Only here the subject matter for comparison is Brian Aldous's Hothouse. Hothouse is also the topic of the previous chapter in his series of explorations. Stratton's comparison focuses mainly on social Darwinism, the economics of ecology, and the aspects of Meeker's and Le Guin's viewpoints applied to Dune and Pacific Edge's ecological approach. Manlove's study looks at a comparison of the physical and the mental, and the nature of concealment in both Dune and Hothouse. Indeed, as Manlove points out, these differences spring from the fact that where Hothouse could be said to concern itself with the body, the medium of Dune is the mind. Manlove's approach inspects the episodic isolation of the individual character's minds in Dune, contrasting it with the arbitrary structure and physicality of Hothouse. With Dune, Manlove finds that it is the primacy of mind that serves to fulfil the action in a world where reality is said to be dialectical. Manlove's study of Frank Herbert's Dune focuses primarily on the first novel, and although he does briefly discuss the expansion of themes in the later books, his study was completed before the publication of Herbert's last book in the series. In R. J. Ellis's Frank Herbert's Dune and the Discourse of Apocalyptic Ecologism in the United States, Dune is approached from a much more in-depth ecological viewpoint, taking the time to dwell upon the individual works of ecological importance contemporary with or predating Herbert's work on Dune. Ellis shares the viewpoint with Stratton that Paul's representation as a hero compromises the coherence of the book's treatment of power as a theme, and therefore also its treatment of ecology as a tool of statecraft. He also shows an awareness of the ecological influences on Frank Herbert, especially those of Rachel Carson and Paul Bigelow Sears, and notes the pseudo-biblical language which Carson uses as being tantamount to dystopic science fiction. In fact, as Ellis examines the apocalyptic treatment of ecology by authors such as Carson and Sears, he argues that this approach sets out to generate anxiety as a means to widen the ecological lobby. Ellis views that this apocalyptic attitude that Carson demonstrates by generating concern for an impending ecological disaster is symptomatic of the key features of late 1950s and early 1960s ecological representations of humanity's environmental future. That is not to say that Ellis feels Carson's work was ineffective. The opposite is the case. He does feel that Dune is very much in the mode of this kind of writing, as too is Herbert's other main ecological influence, Paul Sears. Dune's apocalyptic environment can be seen as mapping fictionally the discursive modes within which the ecological debate about America's future was being conducted. Ellis's study of these ecological writings influence on Herbert notes that neither Carson nor Sears provide any realistic solutions to their respective pending ecological disasters. Instead, they are seeking advocacy of a personal stewardship approach to environmental management, whilst trying to stay away from the necessity of state intervention. The result is like Herbert, both authors consider a holistic approach to ecology, but are not fully conversant in the political ramifications this may entail. Intriguingly, Ellis proposes that where both Sears and Carson are attempting to instruct the public at large in ecological necessities, Herbert is able to explore the political ramifications of apocalyptic ecologism much more freely. Although Ellis views the combination of the theme of a disastrous hero being important to Dune in that it rescues the novel from what he calls banality, it is the continuing focus on this, at the detriment of the ecological theme in later novels, that makes them inferior and reduced to a mere cosmic costume drama. Marie-Noël Zinder's The Moipo of Leto II in Herbert Atreides' saga makes the approach of providing a psychological analysis of the character of Leto II, the god-emperor of Dune. As such, the focus of Zinder's work is centred primarily on this protagonist, who takes centre stage in Children of Dune and God Emperor of Dune. Zinder's approach is to examine Leto II's character based on the work of French psychoanalyst Didier Anzou and to apply his ideas of le moi peau to Herbert's fictional character. Didier's theory of le moi peau, the skin ego, presents the idea of a relationship between the skin of a human as a kind of physical envelope for the body, and a psychic skin which functions in a similar manner in relationship to the ego. Zinder's suggestion is that Leto II's behaviour 
is similar to that of the autistic impulse, while other aspects of his sexual character, or it should be said, rather the lack of it, suggest strong Oedipal connotations. Zinder looks at Leto II in this light, as he literally has a second skin provided by his subsequent metamorphosis, when he joins with the symbiotic sand trout. Zinder also examines the relationship between power and insanity, making comparisons to Frank Herbert's The White Plague, a story which follows the murderous revenge of a scientist taking his own reprisal upon the IRA via a viral plague fatal only to women. Zinder goes on to identify the use of other memory by various characters and the Atreides themselves as being in the tradition of the psychotic family novel. Ultimately, Zinder views Leto II's symbiosis with the skin of a sandworm as being a monstrous moipo, a powerful metaphor for their psychosis and cravings for despotism in the universe which the Atreides inhabit and shape. Zinder concludes that it is through the story of Dune that Frank Herbert demonstrates how psychoanalysis can serve the needs of literary fiction and creates new myths based upon the exploring of the human consciousness. In Susan Maclean's A Psychological Approach to Fantasy in the Dune series, the suggestion is made that the enormous popularity of the Dune series is down to the use of popular and recognised tropes from fantasy literature and fairy tales. By containing myths within the text, especially that of the Oedipus myth and its association with Freudian psychology, Maclean takes the stance that Herbert is able to address the anxieties and aspirations of the adolescent males who still make up a large proportion of science fiction readership. Maclean associates the use of myth in the Dune series as being similar to the use of fairy tales and their function to instruct children in the social interactions, taboos and fears of their given society. In this sense Maclean cites the excellent study of fairy tales, Bruno Bettelheim's The Uses of Enchantment. However, Maclean also views this use of myth in the manner of the psychologist and psychoanalyst, which is usually an approach which relies heavily on iconotropy, which is the deliberate or accidental misinterpretation of myth, and which has a tendency to correlate dreams with myth. That is not to say that this is an inappropriate approach to the use of myth by Frank Herbert in the Dune series, as he is himself guilty of using iconotropy to create his own form of monomyth. This is nowhere more apparent in Maclean's work when she says, like Oedipus himself, Paul atones for his incestuous and patricidal impulses with blindness, exile, and death. Oedipus displays neither incestuous nor patricidal impulses, and this interpretation of the myth is surely based in psychoanalytical iconotropy, which will seemingly be forever associated with Freud. His blindness, exile, and death may correlate to the tragic end of Oedipus's life, but can also in fact be seen as part of the monomyth, or even Lord Raglan's ritualistic steps that the hero undertakes in the life of his own myth. See Chapter 3. Maclean acknowledges that the importance of fantasy themes, or myths, diminish throughout the Dune series, and views Dune as the enactment of the triumph of Oedipal wish fulfilment, whereas Dune Messiah examines the guilt that results from acting out such fantasies. Of more interest is Maclean's identification of the use of sex as a weapon and a tool of statecraft in the Dune series, and it is especially unfortunate that her study was undertaken before the completion of Heretics of Dune, and Chapter House Dune, where this theme is developed to its conclusion. Similarly, Maclean's take on the dualistic archetypes presented in the Dune series examines them from a sexual perspective, looking at the potentially incestuous relationships within the Bene Gesserit breeding program and the Atreides family. This study ultimately revolves around a feminist psychological viewpoint which suggests that the fear of sexuality in the Dune series is the equivalent of the fear of women, where the most fearful women are mothers. This is combined with application of divinity towards the male characters of Paul and Leto II, which represent the irrational. Maclean's conclusion is that, like fairy tales, this combination allows the reader of the Dune series to learn to accept these facets of sexuality and the irrational into their daily lives, providing both a coping mechanism and a means of acceptance. Prana and the Presbyterian Fixation, Ecology and Technology in Frank Herbert's Dune Tetralogy by Leonard Skigage, also examines the first four books of the Dune series in relation to myth. <laughs>
Schigeis, however, is looking at what Herbert viewed as the intrinsic and problematic cultural myth at the heart of modern America. This myth is what Frank Herbert called the Presbyterian fixation, essentially the desire to predict and foresee any problems and provide definite solutions to them with technology. Schigeis views Paul's prescience and concern over the forthcoming jihad and the biological renewal of the human race as being analogous in some respects to the politician's obsession with his new frontier of great society, or even Isaac Asimov's unswerving belief that the scientists can solve all technological problems by creating more technology. Skigage sees Paul's prescience as being unproductive to the point where it develops into an obsessive fixation on the future, noting that Herbert himself had seen this as a metaphor for the practices of large corporations. Skigage's approach examines a number of motifs and influences upon Herbert, including the idea of the Jungian collective unconscious and Alfred Korzybski's general semantics. Looking at Leto II's succession from Paul, he believes that the God Emperor's approach is based upon a tripartite solution designed to step away from the failures of his father. These are as follows. A grasp of intuitions emanating from his Jungian unconscious. Facility with a Zen precognitive, egoless awareness of the present moment as a fluid matrix of possibilities and an adaptation of the Chinese respect for chance. Shkigaj correctly identifies Leto II's tyranny as an oppression which will remove humanity's need for a messianic figure and instead instill a need for the species to take a collective responsibility for its own fate. Shkigaj is insightful when he correctly identifies humanity who in June through the Fremen are presented as geomorphic agents, as part of their environments and ecosystems. In doing so, Skigage realises that Leto II is in fact an interim ecological manager engaged in vision management. Skigage also studies the nature of the Yogin Prana in the Dune series, seeing the spice melange as a metaphor for both the vital principle of life that Prana represents, especially in an ecological sense. Contrary to Zinder's study of the Mwapo of Leto II, Skigage views the God Emperor's symbiosis with the skin of the sand trout as representative of the Zen directive to become the problem itself, to live the problem in all its manifestations, personal, social and environmental. Prana is identified through Yoga and Zen as a means by which Leto II is able to control rather than repress his inner collective unconscious, and is representative of an ideal of self-control based upon a dynamic and necessitous fusion of the internal and external. In comparison, Skigage views the Ixians as being a perfect example of the Presbyterian fixation with technology to solve any and all problems. Their no technology is separate and outside of the natural universe, yet a vast instrument for change. Their insular and mechanical attitude to their problems is the polar opposite to Leto II's approach of a holistic vision of interrelatedness. Skigaj concludes that Paul and Alia's inability to fixate on the present results in their failure to develop the wisdom and long-sightedness to adapt to their environmental needs of Arrakis and the Fremen. It is through Leto II's ability to live in an infinite present, governed by his own prana vitality, that he is able to extend this balance outward to include the society and environment of Dune. In doing so, Skigaj affirms that Herbert was able to successfully blend ecological wisdom with Eastern philosophy in an unprecedented manner. History and Historical Effect in Frank Herbert's Dune by Lorenzo di Tommaso is concerned only with the first Dune novel, and advances ideas in a similar mode to Skigaj's examination of prana. De Tommaso argues that history and historical effect play a major role in the grinding and development of the numerous plots in Dune. This in turn advances what he terms the vitality struggle as a predominant theme. This vitality struggle is as de Tommaso views it, the clash between the differing philosophies of the Imperium and those who live on Arrakis. Indeed, as one of the few historical approaches to Herbert's Dune, De Tommaso is correct that religious history serves the function of allowing the evolution of two of Herbert's major themes in the books, namely that of ecology and the dangers of the messianic hero. Although he mentions a number of the institutions which are formed out of this history, the realisation of the primacy of the Butlerian Jihad in this is not fully realised. 
Nevertheless, the Tommaso study is interesting and certainly approaches the history of the Dune universe in an intriguing manner. However, he views Paul as a product of the historical forces created out of the Butlerian Jihad. This is contrary to the view that Paul is a product of the evolutionary and religious changes instigated by humanity's stagnation and subsequent oppression by highly evolved machines. In this sense, history is a key component to understanding the Dune series, but it is a history moulded out of the need for evolutionary change, and the event that creates this nexus is the Butlerian Jihad. Aside from these articles and studies, there also exist examinations of Herbert's Dune series in the form of study guides, produced by Spark Notes on Dune, Frank Herbert, 2002, and Cliff Notes on Herbert's Dune and other works, published in 1975, both of which fail to approach the whole series. The Cliff Notes does however provide an interesting and insightful look at a number of Frank Herbert's early novels, which are often ignored in the shadow of his Dune series. It is my intention to investigate Frank Herbert's opus Dune and the subsequent novels that make up this unusual epic masterpiece. My objective is to study the key themes of this series as a focal point for an examination of this work as a deliberately subversive undertaking that seeks to undermine the stagnant nature of Golden Age science fiction. I intend to show how Frank Herbert does this through a desire to write science fiction in a proper literary medium, and undermine the tropes that had found their way into American science fiction since the late 1930s and early 40s. Frank Herbert in creating the Dune series reverts to themes and extrapolations from Victorian science fiction works and uses them as a historical and evolutionary foundation for his novels. In connection with his desire to undermine the tropes becoming common in Campbellian science fiction, I also intend to illustrate how Herbert connects his themes to the broader contemporary political and cultural spheres of 1960s America. In doing so, and in particular wishing to highlight the dangers of blind obedience to political leaders, together with their desire to use ecology as a staging platform for their careers, Herbert had created a story that not only resonated with the counterculture and the growing environmental movement of the 1960s, he also created a work whose political and ecological message continues to resonate with the public today. By this achievement, Frank Herbert has created an enduring narrative that continues to remain both critically acclaimed and popular over 50 years since its publication. I also intend to discuss Herbert's Dune and its place in science fiction, and examine its separation within the genre, and demonstrate that it is essentially a Janus facing work. By this I mean that Dune can be seen as both facing backwards to the golden age of science fiction, and ahead to the subsequent new wave. Yet Dune's subversive nature ensured that as a work of science fiction, it stands alone and unique within the genre. I will demonstrate this by examining Herbert's interest in Jungian psychology, the concept of the monomyth, and how he applied these theories to his concerns about what he called disastrous heroes, and the messianic impulse which overtakes civilization. In the wake of World War II, he saw this as a disconcerting and repeatable trend in human society, and his concerns also looked to the kinds of heroes that science fiction was producing as protagonists at the time. Before beginning this study, I think it's both fitting and wise to provide some brief insight into our understanding of both Frank Herbert and the field of science fiction. For that reason, in this introductory chapter, I will present some brief biographical material on Frank Herbert in order to help get a better understanding of this complex writer. I will also provide an overview of the science fiction of the times, in particular the influence of John W. Campbell on what we refer to as the golden age of science fiction. In many ways, Herbert was a great advocate for science fiction, but early in his writing career he had not intended to remain in this genre, knowing as he did that it was considered a literary ghetto by many. Herbert was ultimately iconoclastic towards what we call the golden age of science fiction, in his attempts to undermine the stereotypical pulp science fiction which had developed. In particular, the science fiction protagonist which had emerged out of the late 1930s and early 1940s ideal of the edison aid hero, led to what we referred to as the Van Vautian hero. This was a central focus for Frank Herbert's attack, and also mirrored his concerns regarding real life political and religious leadership. His work represents a paradigm shift in the approach adopted for writing in the genre, 
which would ultimately steer science fiction away from its pulp origins and help it not only to be taken more seriously as a form of literature, but also to act as a kind of vanguard for the new wave of the 1960s and 70s. In a sense the new wave was perceived as a very British phenomenon, centred on New Worlds magazine, but there are a few exceptions in American science fiction, notably the work of Judith Merrill which itself would help spark Harlan Ellison's dangerous visions. Frank Herbert's Dune also marks the beginnings of a new wave in American science fiction which indicated a distinct change for science fiction on the whole. It is for this reason that Brian Aldiss in Trillion Year Spree describes Dune in the context of marking a rebirth of sorts for science fiction, bringing it into a new modern period. That the best science fiction being written today is an improvement on the crude science fiction of the early magazines. That it has acquired many skills and graces, possibly at the expense of new ideas. That we are now in the modern period of science fiction, the birth of which may be dated roughly from the first publication of June 1963 to 64, which period exhibits many of the same traits as does the modern novel, in terms of amplification and sophistication at the expense of innovation. That there remains much to be admired as well as much to be deplored. That recent achievements are real and to be praised. Our perspective is a positive and forward looking one, as we hope will be acknowledged. Frank Herbert's seminal science fiction work, the Hugo and Nebula award winning Dune, has become not only a classic of the genre, but is generally considered to be one of the greatest science fiction novels of all time. This status was confirmed again in a recent poll of the top five science fiction books, as chosen by new scientist readers. Dune came first, some 45 years after its publication. To say that Herbert's work is important would be an understatement, but it is also fair to mention that for whatever reason, Dune in particular is a novel that, when discussed within the context of science fiction criticism, is often highly praised and held up as a work of merit, albeit briefly. It is then subsequently overlooked when it comes to the critical study of the genre, whereas the remainder of Herbert's works are often ignored altogether. I believe that this has got a great deal to do with both Dune's length and complexity. When it has been scrutinised, Dune is often viewed as a singular entity rather than the first part of a story so huge in scale it actually dwarfs the only work to which it is normally compared. Arthur C. Clarke's much quoted selling line for Dune illustrates this fact when he says the novel is unique amongst science fiction novels in the depth of its characterization and the extraordinary detail of the world it creates. I know nothing comparable to it except The Lord of the Rings. Herbert, together with Robert A. Heinlein, Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke, were notable as the big four writers to emerge out of the magazine era, most having started their science fiction writing careers in Astounding Magazine. They became fully fledged authors in their own right, commanding huge advances on their novels and setting themselves apart in both quality of writing and sales. They are what Brian Aldous sees as representing the fundamental success of science fiction as a literary genre in the 20th century, breaking away from the magazine establishment and becoming household names. Ask anyone vaguely acquainted with science fiction to name four modern writers, and it's likely that the answer will be Asimov, Clark, Heinlein and Herbert. These writers form what we might see as a science fiction super league. Advances for their books are in six, often seven figures. Frank Herbert was born on the 8th of October, 1920, at St. Joseph's Hospital in Tacoma, Washington. The son of Frank Herbert Sr., usually known as F.H., and his wife Eileen Marie. Frank Herbert Sr. was of German stock, his father Otto having migrated along with his brother, yet another Frank Herbert, to the United States from Bavaria. Otto married a local Kentucky woman called Mary Ellen Stanley and went on to produce a total of six children, Frank Herbert Sr. being his third son and born in December 1893 in Kentucky. Herbert's mother, Eileen Marie, was nicknamed Babe and was a McCarthy of Irish Catholic descent whose family had fled British oppression in the late 19th century, migrating first to Canada and then later to the United States of America. Her father was John A. McCarthy, who was employed as a mining engineer 
and used to tell young Frank many a tale from his family's history in Ireland. Much about Frank Herbert's upbringing would later influence both his writing career and his philosophical and religious attitudes towards life. In Brian Herbert's very personal and searching biography of his father, Dreamer of Dune, we see how the influence of his Irish aunts not only helped shape his religious attitudes away from Catholicism, but also led to him developing one of the most interesting concepts in his Dune novels. His Irish Catholic maternal aunts, who attempted to force religion on him, became the models for the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood of Dune. It is no accident that the pronunciations of Jesuit and Jesuit are similar, as he envisaged his maternal aunts in the Bene Gesserit of Dune as female Jesuits. The attempted brainwashing by his aunts, as he later termed it, was performed over the protestations of F.H., who was an agnostic. It was Frank Herbert Sr.'s influence on young Frank's religious upbringing that ultimately had the most influence on him. Although Frank never followed any one particular religion, rather having an eclectic approach and taking the best elements as he saw them from a number of religious and esoteric belief systems. His most famous work, Dune, is riddled with the blending of religions and ideas, ranging from the Buddhist-Islamic Fremen with their Zen Sunni and Zen Sufi axioms, to the cynical atheism and religious manipulation of the Bene Gesserit, who are a combination of the Catholic Jesuit order and the philosophy behind Alfred Korzybski's theories on general semantics. Frank's upbringing also brought him into contact with a number of people who had belief systems alternative to the mainstream in America at the time. He knew Coast Salish Indians and also had Nisai friends who had Zen Buddhist beliefs. Frank Herbert Sr. did however instill in his son much of Frank's rebellious nature towards the Catholicism of his mother and her sisters. Again, especially in June, this would have a major influence on Frank, as first and foremost, the majority of the characters in his novels are rebels of some sort or another. These influences of family, faith and an upbringing in Tacoma aside, young Frank Herbert knew sure enough that he wanted to become an author very early on in his life. Although his first full-length novel would not be published until 1956, and having pursued a number of varied careers in his life, young Frank knew in what direction he wanted to go. Oh, I knew what I wanted to do with my life, even when I was quite young. In fact, on my eighth birthday, I told my family, I'm going to be an author. Growing up in Depression-era America, Frank Herbert would see a fair share of hardships in his youth, though his formative years seemed more akin to some reworkings of the stories of Huckleberry Finn. He had learned hunting and woodcraft skills from his uncle Adrian McCarthy, who was by profession a hunter, and it was these skills that would later be enhanced and developed with his relationship with Indian Henry, a Ho Indian with whom he would have a long friendship. Young Frank was also an avid fisherman, and it was during his fishing trips that he furnished his love of adventure stories by reading the works of Jules Verne, Edgar Rice Burroughs, and H. G. Wells. In his youth, Frank's main interest, however, lay in two fields, namely that of photography and writing. Both Frank's mother and father were what Brian Herbert described as on and off alcoholics, and their heavy drinking would be the impetus that sent young Frank off and about on prolonged fishing and hunting trips. Frank Herbert Sr., much like his son, had numerous careers, and for most of Frank's youth was a highway patrol officer, before going on to become a salesman and a security guard. He also ventured into the world of business, even at one point running a speakeasy with Babe and another couple, which didn't help with their alcoholism. After giving up on their speakeasy endeavours, Frank Herbert Sr. moved the family to Tacoma, and it was here that young Frank, while on one of his fishing trips, would meet Indian Henry, with whom he became close friends. Henry taught Frank much about fishing and hunting, and they had a firm friendship for over two years. Much of Frank's relationship with Indian Henry and the skills that he taught him would later be used in his novel Soul Catcher, one of his mainstream novels which features a Native American anti-hero who is going to sacrifice a young white male to allow atonement for the sins of the white man upon the Native American peoples. Over the next two years, the man, Indian Henry, and my father became fast friends. Henry was a Ho, one of the coast's salish, and lived by himself in an old smokehouse. He semi-adopted Frank 
teaching him many of the ways of his people. Frank Herbert himself had a varied number of careers, including those of journalist, jungle survival instructor, cameraman, judo instructor, oyster diver, radio newsreader, and a spell in the US Navy during World War II. He also worked as a speechwriter and publicist for several political campaigns, even though he continually returned to the chosen profession of his youth. As much as some of these occupations influenced his writings, for example, his time in the Seabees and work as a speechwriter cannot have had anything but a serious influence on his ideas for his first novel, The Dragon in the Sea. It was probably his career as what he called a yellow journalist that had the most influence on his writing, for it would be through researching an article on sand dunes, which ultimately he would never complete, that would in due course take him down nearly six years of varied research that would culminate in the writing of Dune. The idea came from an article, I was going to do an article, which I never did, about the control of sand dunes. When Frank reached his twenties in 1940, he moved to Salem in Oregon, where he first began working as a reporter and a photographer for the Oregon Statesman, also occasionally fulfilling the roles of copy editor and night editor. It was during this time working for the Oregon Statesman that Frank met his first wife, Flora. They would soon be married in Tacoma before moving on to San Pedro in California, where he would undertake another journalism job for the Glendale Star. The Second World War at this point encroached on the United States of America, and Frank, along with many others, found himself registering for the draft, in actuality one day before the birth of his first child, Penelope. It was his time in the Navy Seabees where he worked as a rated photographer, which led to both an honourable discharge on medical grounds following an accident, and the seemingly inevitable divorce that accompanied many military careers at the time, by his first wife Flora. Following his discharge, Frank would return to his job at the Oregon Statesman, where slowly at first he began to write again. In 1946, Frank began attending the University of Washington, where he would later meet his second wife and great love of his life, Beverly Ann Stewart, or Bev as she would be known. He would never finish his degree, however, due to the fact that he only took those classes he was interested in, while ignoring those he had no time for. Frank and Bev would get married that very same year, and soon have two children together, both boys, Brian and Bruce. Bev would be both a major inspiration and a source of encouragement for Frank, helping to support him during his early attempts at writing. Frank had previously published a short story in Esquire magazine in 1945, It would not be until some seven years later that he published his first science fiction story. Looking for Something appeared in the magazine Startling Stories and became his first work of science fiction. But it was with his first novel, The Dragon in the Sea, that he made a real impact on the genre. It told the story of the psychological pressures on the small crew of a Hell-class submarine, who fighting in a near-future war, operate behind enemy lines to steal oil. The Dragon in the Sea illustrated Frank's strong interest in Jungian psychology, but would also show the beginnings of his interest in ecological and anti-war themes, which he would continue to develop in many of his later works, but especially in June. Although publishing quite a few short stories in various anthologies over the years, the short story format was never really his medium, and he never made any significant impact in this area. More often than not, Herbert's short stories would often provide the seed that he would develop later and allow to germinate into a novel, a good example of this being Green Slaves, published in 1965, but would become another one of his ecologically driven novels, The Green Brain, published the following year. June was first serialised in Analogue, appearing in December 1963 to February 1964 as June World, and Prophet of June, the second and third books of the Dune novel, from January to May in 1965. Dune World's appearance also coincided with a colour cover by John Schoener, who also provided the black and white illustrations for the story. Schoener's artwork would continue to grace Herbert's Dune series for many years, being the artist whom Frank felt had properly captured the feel of the stories. Dune was then published in its entirety as a novel that same year, winning the first ever Nebula Award for Best Novel. The following year saw Frank Herbert jointly win the Hugo Award for Dune, and found the author to be quite prolific, 
with three novels appearing after magazine serialisations. The Green Brain, Destination Void and The Eyes of Heisenberg all appeared in 1966. The late 60s saw three more novels, with The Heaven Makers and The Santa Roga Barrier being followed by the second part of the first great Dune trilogy, Dune Messiah, in 1969. A number of other books followed in the early 70s, and Frank, due to his newfound success as a novelist, sought new opportunities, including finding work as a lecturer at the University of Washington for a brief period between 1970 and 72, where he taught general studies and interdisciplinary studies. In particular, this period during the early 70s saw him finally end his career as a journalist in order to concentrate on his science fiction writing. The final part of the first great Dune trilogy, Children of Dune, was published in 1976 and was soon followed along with the Dosadi experiment in 1977. The late 70s and early 80s also marked the beginning of a literary partnership with Frank's long-term friend Bill Ransom. This culminated in the Pandora trilogy, a follow-on from some of Frank's concepts in Destination Void, and consisted of the Jesus Incident, the Lazarus Effect, and the Ascension Factor. God Emperor of Dune, published in 1981, marked the beginning of the second great Dune trilogy, which was soon followed by its sequels, Heretics of Dune in 1984, and Chapter House Dune in 1985. The year 1984 also marked the advent of the death of Frank Herbert's second wife, Beverly, whom he had been married to for 38 years. She died after a long battle with cancer, and Frank Herbert included a moving afterward about his wife in the final June novel he was to write. Frank Herbert married his third wife, Teresa Shackelford, one of his former literary representatives, in 1985. The following year, Frank Herbert published Man of Two Worlds, in collaboration with his son Brian, but was to pass away on the 11th of February 1986, aged 65. He had been undergoing treatment for pancreatic cancer at the time, and died from an embolism following surgery for the disease. The Ascension Factor, the final part of his collaborative Pandora trilogy, was published posthumously, with co-author Bill Ransom having noted that Frank Herbert had completed his parts of the novel before passing away. Frank Herbert's diverse interests and career paths helped inform his work with a vast array of ideas and styles, and it is for this reason that he became one of the biggest selling and most respected of science fiction authors. Dune is still to this day considered one of the finest works of science fiction to be produced, and its influence can be seen not only on the stylistic intentions of the new wave, but also on the new postmodern epic space operas which presently dominate the genre. He was like one of Paul Atreides' motifs, a Janus-facing bridge between the Campbellian era of Golden Age science fiction, which he subtly and subversely attacked, and the generation who came after. Like Frank Herbert, it was the New Wave's intent to raise science fiction out of the magazine era gutter it was stagnating in, trying to infuse it with new stylistic modes and literary aspirations. In the history of science fiction, Frank Herbert lies between the so-called golden age of the American magazine era and the mostly but not exclusively British New Wave, the two periods which dominated and defined the genre in the 20th century. The term science fiction as we know it today is generally acknowledged to have been first used by Hugo Gernsback in the 1920s. The term had been used long before this, most notably for the first time by William Wilson in his work a little earnest book upon a great old subject. We're referring to a comment by Thomas Campbell regarding fiction and poetry not being the reverse of the truth. Wilson stated that this applies especially to science fiction in which the revealed truths of science may be given, interwoven with a pleasant story which itself may be poetical and true. It should be noted that at this point in time, the term science fiction was not in popular use. Gernsback is often recognised as one of the modern founding fathers of science fiction, and the annual Hugo Awards are named after him in his honour. Gernsback published a number of technologically orientated magazines, mainly on electronics and radio equipment, which he would use as a vehicle to present his own stories, most notably Ralph 124C41+. These included magazines such as Modern Electrics and Electrical Experimenter, Science and Invention, 
and most famously Amazing Stories amongst many others. It is with Amazing Stories in 1926 that the first bona fide science fiction magazine was published and the world was introduced to the American pulp science fiction story. Gernsback put forward the term science fiction in the first issue of Amazing Stories in order to describe the content of his magazine's tales. He saw it as an entertaining and didactic form of fiction which set new standards in literature, though by the time of the publication of another of Gernsback's magazines, Science Wonder Stories, he would discard this term for science fiction. Gernsback's own science fiction term was, as we can see, simply another way of describing those works which were generally considered scientific romances. By science fiction I mean the Jules Verne, H.G. Wells and Edgar Allan Poe type of story, a charming romance intermingled with scientific fact and prophetic vision. Not only do these amazing tales make tremendously interesting reading, they are always instructive. So the term science fiction had a relatively short lifespan before science fiction became popular. Another iconic editor of science fiction stories, one who would have enormous influence on his writers, was John Wood Campbell Jr. Campbell's role as editor of the magazine's Astounding Stories, Astounding Science Fiction, and later Analogue, was crucial to the development of science fiction's golden age. Campbell thought that science fiction was to be taken seriously, and have a distinct relationship to the understanding of science and technology. As it had been pointed out before, science fiction was no more for scientists than ghost stories were for ghosts. However, no single editor or writer would have such a dominant influence on the shape that science fiction took, until perhaps the work of Michael Murcock's New Worlds magazine, which would carry the flag for the mainly British new wave in the 1960s and 70s. The golden age of science fiction was epitomised by the editorial influence of John W. Campbell. Campbell was a science fiction writer himself, and was responsible for the discovery of just about every major science fiction writer, including such famous names as A. E. Van Vogt, Robert A. Heinlein, Lester Del Rey, Theodore Sturgeon, L. Ron Hubbard, and Isaac Asimov. Campbell was a colossal influence on the genre and its writers between 1937 and the early 1960s. His attitude to what should be published as science fiction could sometimes be contradictory, with his initial approach towards real science and technology being at the heart of good science fiction. Roger Luckhurst notes that the employment of a number of scientific and engineering professionals by Campbell would create an engineer paradigm that underlies the emergence of American science fiction in the pre-1945 era. Later, and to the dismay of many writers who would epitomise that engineer paradigm, Campbell would develop a strong desire to see stories featuring psionics and psi-powers appear in his magazines. Typical works in this mode would include the likes of L. Ron Hubbard and A. E. Van Vogt, whose name became attached to this sort of mentally evolved superhero. It was specifically this type of hero that Frank Herbert would set up for a fall in his Dune series. Very often expressing right-wing views in his editorials, Campbell would come to alienate almost all of his writers, including long-term friends such as Robert A. Heinlein. Kingsley Amos in New Maps of Hell saw Campbell as a person whose vaunted crazy ideas, coupled with the self-importance which he placed on science fiction, was giving the genre a seriously bad name. Amusingly, he puts it thus, Kicking out the cranks who seem bent on getting science fiction a bad name, John Campbell, the editor of Astounding with his Psy Machine and his interest in reincarnation and his Superman theory, Reginald Bretnor and A. E. Van Vogt with their conversion to Korzybski's so-called general semantics, L. Ron Hubbard and A. E. Van Vogt and John Campbell with the mysterious mental science of Dianetics. Of one book on the subject, the blurb claims proudly that four of the first people who read it went insane. John W. Campbell's tenure as editor of these prominent magazines saw the birth of a number of major science fiction tropes and themes, ranging from the space operas of E. E. Doc Smith's Landsman series, the scientific legal dramas of Asimov's Robot series, Heinlein's speculative fiction, and the weird psi powers of L. Ron Hubbard's philosophies. Ironically, it was most likely Herbert's own use and interest of psionic powers in Dune that attracted Campbell to publish the story in the first place. Although corresponding regularly over the material, 
Frank Herbert and John W. Campbell never actually met in person. It was the inversion of the heroic theme in Dune Messiah that would prevent Campbell from publishing it. Having built ASF on the concept of the hero, Campbell did not accept the concept of the anti-hero, particularly an anti-hero whose failures are implicitly bound up with parapsychological faculties. The distinctions between hard science fiction focused on technology, science and engineering, which Campbell advocated as being purely what science fiction stories should be about, was contradicted by his later developing interest in psi powers and parapsychology. He did maintain that there could be a balance between the two, where authors could use such motifs to explore aspects of science fiction. The question was whether such things were possible or impossible, and if they were the former, then there was a case for them being in science fiction stories. As A.I. Berger notes, however, Dune simply overpowered such distinctions despite Herbert's foundation in the ecology of the deserts. The 1960s in particular started to sound the death knell of traditional Campbellian science fiction and the counterculture emerging in this period, especially through the American universities, embraced three books in particular. One was The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien's high fantasy epic. The other two were deeply influential science fiction novels, namely Robert A. Heinlein's Hugo award-winning Stranger in a Strange Land and Frank Herbert's Dune. These works of importance are of particular relevance to the social upheaval going on in America, which would be a decade that saw some of science fiction's greatest dreams realised, especially with the moon landing in 1969. All three works have a number of similar themes, and all are quite impressive in their scope. They share ecological themes, June more so than the others, which captured the imagination of the university underground, and some have claimed even helped to spark the development of the growing ecological movement in the 60s. They also include strong messianic tendencies, though The Lord of the Rings has without a doubt the least flamboyant and imposing saviour of the three novels. Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land became almost a bible for the counterculture, some of its ideas even becoming notoriously embraced by Charles Manson's family. The books also shared an interest in water-related themes and concepts, water often having a cleansing effect capable of defeating the evils of Middle-earth in Tolkien's trilogy. The Nazgul are, for example, first defeated by the river at the Ford of Bruin, where it swallows them up consuming their steeds, and the armies of Saruman at Isengard are defeated by the Ents unblocking a dam and flooding the place. Water also becomes the focus of the religion of Valentine Smith in Heinlein's novel, Charles Manson's family famously copying the water rituals from the book. In Dune, water is the essence of survival, and its importance is monumental on the planet Arrakis. The 1960s also saw the emergence of a revolt across the Atlantic, where back in Great Britain, the new wave of science fiction was beginning to emerge. From the period of the early 60s up until the early 70s, arose the new wave of science fiction. It was most notably a very, though not exclusively, British reinvention of the traditional American pulp science fiction of the Golden Age. The new wave of the 60s took its name from the Nouvelle Vague movement of French cinema from the late 1950s to early 60s, and was most notably characterised by filmmakers such as François Truffaut and Jean-Luc Goddard. The new wave represented a sharp swing away from Campbellian science fiction, and the upbeat conservative material produced in magazines in the United States of America, which up until this time were dominating the field. In particular, the new wave of science fiction would still carry on the magazine tradition, though at this point, science fiction writers were successfully selling their novels outside of the magazine environment. In Britain, however, it was New World's magazine, under the editorial leadership of Michael Murcock, that would come to represent the new wave as a whole. Its writers, along with Murcock, included the likes of J.G. Ballard, Thomas M. Dish, Brian Aldiss, John Clute, Harlan Ellison, and Samuel Delaney, to name but a few. In America, Harlan Ellison's dangerous visions also had significant impact, but the new wave belonged mostly to British writers. American writers would often use the vehicle of New Worlds to publish work that was seen as unpalatable to the American publishing houses and magazines. As a literary force, the new wave was not localised to the United Kingdom, but as a publishing phenomenon, Great Britain would be its home. In saying this, 
New Worlds was itself not a product of the late 60s and early 70s, having had its first publication way back in 1946. Plans had existed to publish it beforehand, but World War II intervened and put it on hold for a while, as a number of its potential early writers entered the war effort. However, the magazine did not truly emerge with its new ethos until the early 1960s, when Murcock declared its intent to publish work by both new and established authors which could not find a home anywhere else. Murcock was primarily a fantasy writer as opposed to science fiction at the time, and had himself published in New Worlds and Science Fantasy, which under the earlier editorship of John Carnell, had been publishing work that he felt should be well written and have ambitious themes. Murcock himself believed that it was in Science Fantasy that some of the first new wave material appeared in the late 50s. Murcock began working as editor for New Worlds in 1964, following the purchase of the magazine and its sister product Science Fantasy by David Warburton of Robertson Vinter, and the subsequent retirement of John Carnell. New Worlds, along with its various other sister publications, had found themselves struggling under bad sales and circulation during the early 1960s, and it was Warburton who stepped in to purchase both magazines from Nova Publications, the magazine's previous owners. Roberts and Vinter were looking to break into a more established, literary and respectable form of publishing, having previously published adult magazines, and felt that these products were perfect, bringing on board Chiral Bonfiglioli as editor for Science Fantasy, and a 23-year-old Murcock for New Worlds. Writers and artists severely dissatisfied with the way science fiction had been developing in the USA, and who wanted to produce experimental work would find a home at New Worlds, and over the next few years would produce some of the most unorthodox and experimental science fiction that was quite contrary to the established mode of Campbellian science fiction across the Atlantic. As Murcock wrote, it would specialise in experimental work by Burroughs and artists like Paul Lozzi, but it would be popular. It would seek to publicise such experimenters. It would publish all those writers who had become demoralised by a lack of sympathetic publishers and by baffled critics. It would attempt a cross fertilization of popular science fiction, science, and the work of the literary and artistic avant garde. The new wave held a particular distaste for the American pulp science fiction era, typified by the ideas spearheaded by John W. Campbell, but in addition to this, it also wanted to see a new mode of science fiction literary criticism, especially other than that presented by the likes of Kingsley Amos. Murcock's continuing disgust at what he saw as almost a death knell of science fiction from the USA was often vocally and publicly made apparent, as was his loathing of Amos's work. As he pointed out once, science fiction has gone to hell and Kingsley Amos is mapping it. I believe that we needed more rigorous criticism to seek definitions of the forms we were working in, since we were all somewhat confused. I find, for instance, the science fiction criticism of Amos, Crispin and Conquest condescending, fatuous and weary, characterised by a kind of hearty complacency and defiant philistinism, it had a blousy air to it. It was no better than the pieties of Sunday newspaper lead reviewers which had in common the atmosphere of the social club, the saloon bar, the locker room. The new wave was rebelling against what it saw as unimaginative, badly written and conservative mainstream work, which was more often than not trying to inform this new generation of writers how to go about their business. In that sense, the new wave was not only developing its stylistic and thematic elements through their own sense of innovation, but also through their strong reactionary and almost hostile dislike for the very kind of fiction in this milieu that they despise so openly. The likes of Robert Conquest, Edmund Crispin and Kingsley Amis were seen to be openly condescending, urging that science fiction was a genre and its writers should accept the limitations of it as such. It was shocking to be condescended to by Robert Conquest, to be taken aside by Edmund Crispin and told over some gin or other that all our ideas had been tried and found wanting in the 1920s, that the appeal of the science fiction genre was that it was a genre fulfilling like the mystery story certain acceptable genre expectations. Amos, with his lazy paradoxes, reviewed the first issue of New Worlds We Produced by referring to Burroughs 
as not the far more interesting and imaginative Edgar Rice, but the boring William. The new wave in fact relished the works of William Burroughs, Allen Ginsberg, Jacques Kerouac, and in particular Mervyn Peake. As it began to make its mark on the genre, it found that it was in fact alienating some of its older audience, while at the same time attracting a new readership. The American Campbellian Old Guard, the likes of Conquest, Crispin and Amos, as well as the likes of Brian Aldiss, were openly critical of the magazine's content, although others such as Judith Merrill would provide much praise for the magazine. New Worlds would ultimately see a rejection of the technocratic forms of American science fiction, moving away from the rocket ships, H-bombs, laser guns and supermen that so typified the Golden Age era, to produce a more inward-looking, reflective form of science fiction which would be better termed as speculative fiction rather than science fiction. It was J.G. Ballard, whose work was seen as the backbone of New Worlds by Murcock and one of the guiding lights of the New Wave, who typified this idea, in that he firmly believed that science fiction needed to turn away from outer space and look to the inner space of the human psyche. The 70s would begin as typically downbeat in science fiction, with again films and literature depicting disastrous futures and ecological nightmares. The end of the 70s would also see a surge in the big budget science fiction movie, culminating with the likes of Close Encounters of the Third Kind and Star Wars. These films were also attempts to get away from the downbeat negativism pervading the general consciousness, especially in the United States following the end of the Vietnam War. Science fiction movies would begin at this point to more and more shape the public's perception of science fiction, increasingly requiring excessively extravagant budgets to push the envelope on what is technically possible in the medium. The huge canvas created in the cinema was the antithesis to what the new wave was trying to achieve in its literature. I believe this was very much responsible for the turning away from the inner space concepts of that particular time, and creating a resurgence in the general public's mind for huge concepts science fiction in outer space. Frank Herbert's Dune series can be viewed as both a product of the latter days of the golden age of science fiction and a work in a similar subversive mode of the new wave that followed. But in saying that he is part of the new wave would be remiss, as I feel his influence, especially that of Dune, was the spur that set this new tradition on its way with a newfound confidence. It is safe to say that as a science fiction writer, or even a writer of any kind, Frank Herbert's work is a careful melange of influences, themes and directions, making him notably unique in the genre, being a man of two worlds. It is for this reason that his work has remained steadfastly popular and critically acclaimed. Having presented this brief discussion on the golden age and the new wave of science fiction, we can firmly put Frank Herbert in his correct place and time. Beginning his tenure as a science fiction writer towards the mid-50s, although having published prior to this, it was really the early to mid-1960s that began to see his influence grow. The impact of his other works will perhaps unjustly remain in the shadow of Dune and its successors, which were written over a period of 20 years. Brian Aldiss viewed H.G. Wells as being set apart from those writers occupied in a similar mode, and I believe Herbert's Dune series has such an identifiable position in science fiction history. It stands apart from the Golden Age, and cannot really be identified with the new wave which is often regarded in a very British light. Dune in particular is a subversive work which gripped the same imagination that the rising ecological movement and spirit of inhibition and individualism maintained on the counterculture of the 1960s. Science fiction is to a certain extent reinventing itself with Dune, turning its back on a stagnation that had developed out of a once prosperous and innovative golden age in America. It looked to older and more inquisitive times for its influence and recaptured the literary achievements of Victorian science fiction as it turned its back upon the mass-produced efforts of its contemporaries. As Frank Herbert says in June when introducing Paul Atreides, we should take the most special care that you locate Moadib in his place. This too we must do with Frank Herbert, for although we know he was born in Tacoma, Washington, like his hero Paul, Arrakis, the planet known as June, is forever his place.